Now, I was a chemist, and even this still feels like wizardry. You, me, and everyone else, we used to think that progress in leading edge chip design was all about making things smaller. How tight we brought together the metal lines and building the finest of features, enabling the fastest of transistors. We all know it was never that simple, but was it ever really the answer? Of course, you can build better by focusing on the circuits, on the transistor layout. What if the real story was about what happens below that scale? Modern chip design relies on the way we shape and control matter, or even individual atoms in some cases. And every new generation of computing depends on how small the transistor is, but also on how it's designed. Through careful and meticulous research, we actually now control the geometry of the transistor, and it relies on the ability to build perfect materials one atomic layer at a time. Thing is, at these scales, it's where physics and chemistry blur into each other. It's where you can't use a beaker and a Bunsen burner with a stopwatch like you could in the lab. Every reaction has to stop exactly when it means to. These machines have to ensure that a single layer forms perfectly on a wafer, and it has to be uniform across that wafer time and time again. Now today's video sponsor is ASM, a company deeply embedded in this industry, and we're gonna go through what enables that level of complexity with them. Now that ability to manipulate matter, that's what defines success or failure. It's what makes computing possible. We still scale, but scaling demands discipline of the physical realm. The future of performance, power and efficiency now depends on exactly how precisely we can build these very specific shapes at the angstrom level. That's a tenth of a nanometer. It depends on how well you can bend the rules of nature without breaking them. Now for 60 years, the industry's progress has been measured by the number we give to that process node. Literally speaking, from one micron planar transistors in the 1980s, where one micron actually meant something, to the name three nanometers today. That doesn't actually mean much, but has acted as a shorthand for advancement. Realistically, there's only so much room at the bottom, but the geometry race is reaching a critical juncture. The smallest metal pitches in logic transistors now measure less than 30 nanometers across. And even if we talk about five nanometer transistors, even though we build trillions of them a day right now, they are still delicate structures. We've told each other for years that at that scale, electrons can leak, interfaces can blur, and every improvement comes with exponentially higher cost. Now to put that into perspective, in 2000, manufacturing a new node might have cost a few hundred million dollars. We're talking about buying all the tools to make a volume production fab. Today, however, if you want to build a three nanometer process fab, a gigafab, it requires more than $20 billion of investment, materials, and design infrastructure. And that's not including the decade of research that went into building that process. Even with the demands we have today in AI, the ratio of cost to gains in performance is very much a bad equation. And to a lot of people, it's getting worse. Thing is, density is still improving a bit, but energy efficiency is stagnating, relying on chiplets to offset the yield loss that eats into the margins that geometry once delivered for free. And this is why scaling today is much more than just simply making these structures smaller. Modern transistors are complex 3D architectures built from precisely engineered materials. It takes a family of techniques, accelerated on multiple fronts, in order to control an atomic structure destined to deliver the next computer and electronics breakthrough. What used to mostly be a focus on optics has now become a contest in material science, and that's where companies like ASM operate. Now, solving that 3D scaling problem is tough, I'll give you that. Even simple transistors go through several dozen steps to be built. We're talking wafer cleaning, oxide growth, shallow trans isolation, etch, liner, fill, planarization, strip, dope, anneal, clean, epitaxy growth, hard mask deposition, lithography, anisotropic etch, and everything else. I've probably missed a few there. But we cycle through these several times in different amounts. If we speak about more modern transistors like FinFETs or gates all around, they often need multiple cycles of these. Because what ends up happening is that we depend on methods that turn material control into something predictable. It's not just about drawing shapes and hoping physics cooperates. Some of these processes are bulk processes, sure, but a lot of them are selective. We're at a stage where we set up chemical reactions that stop by themselves at a very specific endpoint. This enables us to build layers one at a time whose thickness is defined by how many times we run the cycle. 
This process is called atomic layer deposition, and it does this with surface limited chemistry. We start with a series of gases, called precursors, that enter the chamber one at a time. Each stage of the reaction process creates intermediate chemicals that only react with specific sites on that prepared wafer surface. Then, once the reaction stops, the chamber is purged before the next step. The point is, with self-selective processes, your growth per cycle can be small, but it's extremely repeatable. It's often near one angstrom, so thickness becomes just simply counting up the process cycles. But because the reaction occurs at the surface and coverage can be absolute, even inside deeper narrow features that line of sight methods might miss. We even have thermal atomic layer deposition techniques that prioritizes clean surfaces because they use plasma assisted variants which extend the usable temperature window and enable chemistries that would not react otherwise. The second process in this is called epitaxy. Sometimes we need to build structures with specific features and directions. For example, if we need to build on one plane of a crystal, a crystal lattice. Epitaxy solves this problem. It grows a crystal layer that matches the direction and atomic substrate layout. This is how channels and source drain regions are set up with the right composition, including silicon germanium layers for nanosheets. If we control temperature, pressure, and gas flow, we control the thickness and composition, where crystal quality is held uniform across the wafer for extreme consistency. Together, these methods are what are enabling scaling. Atomic layer deposition places precise dielectrics and barriers where the device needs them to be. Epitaxy sets channels and junctions with the lattice and lattice strain that you want. When structures move into three dimensions, this control keeps things like electron leakage in check. It preserves the key metrics like electron mobility and device device variation. Now, that's great and all, but what can we do with this? The industry developed gate all around transistors as the answer to the scaling problem. Because gate lengths of transistors drop into the tens of nanometers physically, the important properties like how a gate responds to electric field, or if the source and drain interfere with each other, start to really matter. Gate all around restores that control by wrapping the gate fully around the channel. The result is lower leakage at the same threshold. The electric field control reverts back to closer to ideal physics again. We're talking the uh, legendary 60 millivolts per order of magnitude at room temperature. Uh, the distance between the source and drain can also shrink further without biasing the transistor, because biasing would waste power. With this wrapping, the industry is moving beyond the fin-based designs we've had for over a decade. Now the modern implementation of gate all-around transistors uses stacked nanosheets. We're talking here lattice layers of silicon and silicon germanium that are grown on top of one another. The stack is then etched into channel regions. We have a dummy gate that holds the stacks in place, and then we selectively also etch the silicon germanium away to free the sheets. We then add dielectric spaces between the sheets and the source and drain. We're talking things like high K dielectrics and work function metals. The design of these spaces is, designed, is meant to be selective and highly controlled. Now, after a few other steps, what we're left with is a gate around transistor. The width and the thickness of each sheet sets the drive strength of the transistor. The number of sheets sets the effective channel width, and because the widths add, that's what makes gate all around so powerful. Most of the fabs implementing gate all around today are set on three or four sheets. It's a balance because the more sheets you have, the more process cost you have as well. But ultimately, the gains are practical. It enables better control of the electric field, which allows the transistor to run at a lower voltage for the same frequency. It means leakage is reduced, saving power. But only if it works, if every step is meticulously planned. Almost down, like I said, to the monolayer. Alignment tolerances for all of this, for deposition and next control, determine how even the sheets are across the wafer. And at the end of the day, a gate all around transistor offers double digit performance improvement over fin based devices, but the sensitivity to the materials and the geometry is actually very high. Now, gate all around is also a bridge to what comes next. If you've seen my iMEC roadmap videos, you'll know that in the future we expect CC FETs or complementary FETs. These are stacked transistor designs where we're stacking sheets on gates on sheets on gates. In a perfect world, this would double the density, but it requires even tighter alignment more selective etches and depositions, and stricter thermal budgets. You want to make sure that you build the one device on top of the other, but you don't cook what's underneath. Complementary effects follow the same paradigm when it comes to high volume manufacturing, precision of the physics with chemistry at every interface and with control. On top of all this, one thing I haven't broached yet is selectivity. When you deposit a layer, you want to only deposit it where you need it to be and nowhere else. If you can do that, it removes the entire etch and cleanup cycles that could create defects. 
in dense three-dimensional structures, the difference between a working device and a dead device could be as simple as a few metal nanometers on a sidewall. We can solve that by using selective processes that shift that risk into some really cool controllable chemistry. Now, area selective deposition does this by exploiting chemistry at the surface. It enables mature growth at a particular area at a process called nucleation. It means on the nucleated site we can grow and you can't grow anywhere else. The end result is the ability to functionalize the surface, i.e. give that surface a very specific property for a chemical reaction profile. That enables a self-assembled monolayer that blocks other reactive sites. You can tune the properties like the plasma conditions, the chemical ligand choice and the purge timing so that as you grow that metal layer or a metal and metal layer, you initiate only at the intended surface for the amount of time you need. A useful process shows strong growth on target with near zero growth off target. And it does so with defect counts low enough that once you add it all up, there are real savings in the cost to build that chip and yield. All this matters at the interface. That's the boundary between metals and insulators, which set the key parameters like contact resistance, barrier performance, and long-term stability. When you have that selective flow, you can lay down particular metals that are important, such as cobalt or ruthenium, only where they're needed and without creating any voids. That's another area we could cover. Selectivity does sound a little academic at first, but when you need it to survive real integration, it matters. In practice, the most reliable route to use is atomic layer deposition chemistry, and that naturally prefers one surface over another. Today's sponsor ASM has actually been deeply involved in this for years through their high K dielectric and metal gate work. The atomic layer deposition process can grow work function tuning layers on a prepared metal gate stack without unintentionally thickening the surrounding dielectrics. The result is a cleaner interface profile, lower contact resistance variation, and fewer downstream corrections in the flow. Fewer corrective steps means fewer defects, which ultimately shows up as higher yield and cheaper chips. Thing is, with any process, there are limits and trade-offs, but that's where the ability to bend physics to your will comes in. When the right layer grows only where it should, the architecture can hold its shape. That prepares the ground for the next section, where vertical stacking or packaging depends on the same control at the larger scales. But the thing is, if we go full circle on this, modern process node development isn't simply about scaling the optics. It's a material science problem that reaches from the atom all the way through to the packaging. Technologies like gate or around only work because we can build interfaces that are uniform and because insulator and metal depositions are exact. Techniques like area selected deposition keeps growth only where it belongs. And it's that same control that either builds a nano sheet or keeps a through silicon via from shortening or keeps a HBM stack from drifting out of specification. Things like energy and reliability follow from that. We're talking like all the good stuff, lower leakage, lower contact resistance, and fewer latent failures that show up months after deployment. The roadmap here is clear, but it's not gonna be easy. The industry leaders are the ones developing better precursor chemicals, 3D structures that can withstand wider temperature windows during manufacturing, and designs that enable higher selectivity on pattern wafers. If we can combine this with the high throughput demands required to deliver silicon to the market, all the better. That is the lever that keeps progress moving. It means the next decade of performance will be written monolayer by monolayer or atom by atom if we have to. Now, if you're interested in finding out more or perhaps you're in this field already and looking for an interesting challenge at the heart of current or next generation semiconductors, then go check out the ASM Careers website where they might have something right up your street.